If you can ride one or more bodily sensation waves of one or more of eight unpleasant feelings, you can go pursue anything you want in life. Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Girlfriend Doctor Show. I'm Dr. Anna and I'm thrilled to be here with you today. You know, this is the season we're entering into spring. I can't wait for spring to get here. And you know, when you see those blossoms and flowers and the greenery start to kind of just start to emerge, you're like, okay, I'm ready for this. I'm so ready for this. And if you are like me, ready for it, especially being in Dallas now where I'm living, we had that terrible, terrible ice and snowstorm and and um, really half of Dallas was frozen and it was really troublesome. And you think, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? What if we don't have power? What's, you know, what's our next right step? And a lot of anxiety can come into play. And we um, interviewed earlier this month, I interviewed Dr. Caroline Leaf and uh, her input and her, if you haven't listened to that episode, go back and listen to it and be sure to get her book, Clean Up Your Mental Mess, because it is just training our brain to really be empowered and to clean up all the clutter. And that's really important because anxiety is such an important issue. And in fact, one of our clients wrote in after that episode, and this is from Amanda, and she wrote in and she said, Dr. Anna, I just feel that every time I take a step forward, I take two steps back. And I feel at this point in my life, I should know what I want to do for my life and what my purpose is, but I feel lost, um, distressed, and, you know, what's the next right step? And so I think that's really important. A lot of times there is that confusion. We don't know what the next right step is, and we're fearful. What can we do? So I think we can't talk enough about this topic. You know, we're worrying about increasing rates of depression, increasing emotional disturbances, increasing reliance on antidepressants. And where is the answer, truthfully? The answer is empowered within us. And I, I tell you, I couldn't do anything without my faith, without starting my day with gratitude and prayer and reflecting on where I saw love yesterday, where I laughed and where I could have laughed more. Just that simple practice of doing, you know, that really, that, that training of my brain to focus, to go to bed thinking about what I'm grateful for and where, I, where I've loved and seen loved. And um, and waking up with the same thing, even before getting out of bed, before opening my eyes, I have trained myself to really reflect on all the things that I'm grateful for. At least one thing, right? What's where did where was one place I saw love, felt love, gave love? Where was one place that I laughed at myself, could have laughed at myself more? You know, where did I see see humor? Where could I have laughed more? And and that simply has changed my life, changed my physiology. That's part of an alcohol alkalinizing aspect that I, you know, that I talk about in my books, the hormone fix and keto green 16. It's the green part of keto green, right? The alkaline part. When we reduce cortisol and increase oxytocin, our physiology is better. And, you know, and, and that is, that is just essential. That is groundbreaking. That is like an important check and balance to do with ourselves. Check your urine pH, get my urine pH strips and, and check that, you know, check to make sure you're getting alkaline. And if not, is it your nutrition? Is it toxic thoughts? Is it chronic stress? Is it perceived loss of control? Is it underlying anxiety? What's happening? So uh, today I brought a dear friend of mine on the show, a woman that I admire tremendously. She has been a leader in, gosh, let's say emotional maturity and gaining people, uh, emotional mastery, let's say, and um, gaining people their confidence back, helping people navigate some of the most difficult circumstances and traumas in their lives. And she is that peace, you know, just such a, such an amazing presence to be around, just an incredibly peaceful person. So I'm going to introduce you today to a dear friend and colleague, Dr. Joan Rosenberg. She has been on, um, 
like pretty much every network out there, PBS, the own network, um, gosh, you know, just so much. And she is a California licensed psychologist. She speaks on how to build confidence, emotional strength, resilience, achieving emotional conversation on relationship mastery while integrating neuroscience and psychotherapy, also with suicide prevention. She's an Air Force veteran, a professor and graduate, a graduate of psychology at Pepperdine University in Los Angeles. And her latest book is 90 Seconds to a Life You Love, How to Master Your Difficult Feelings to Cultivate Lasting Confidence, Resilience, and Authenticity. It's a great book. I've given so many copies away and we're going to dig deep with Joan. Welcome, Joan. It is good to have you here on my virtual couch. It has been so long. We've been trying to get together and it's really nice to see you. And likewise, I'm thrilled that I'm here. So it's, uh, it's very sweet to be able to talk to you. Oh, I feel the same. And um, I'll let our audience know, like Joan and I were just chatting before we started recording and I'm like, uh-uh, we're not saying another word. Let's do it on air because we are not alone in this. And we're talking about, you know, we were talking about anxiety and, and Joan is the expert in this emotional mastery. And one of the issues is being really vulnerable here. We're in our girlfriend, Dr. Community is being really vulnerable with some of the things that that you know I'm dealing with, and maybe Joan's dealing with. Other people, maybe you watching right now, are dealing with. And one of the things is date. Like for me, it's dating, being anxious, and starting to date, and feeling like, oh my gosh, like man, it's vulnerable. Like as competent women as we are, why is this so challenging? <laughs> Yeah, well, again, I, I think that what it, it immediately does, Anna, the way I think about it is that we, it just puts us in an immediate state of vulnerability. And, and so it's like, it's like, uh oh, you know, I, I know that I want to invest in this, but I also, there's a part of me that goes, eh, do I want to get hurt again? And, and, the, and the truth of the matter is, is in order, in, in order to have what we want, we have to be willing to be hurt. We have to, to be, and what I mean by being hurt is, being disappointed or sad or frustrated or, or those kinds of things. And, but, it, it, but intimacy doesn't come without that other part. So, so the vulnerability to intimacy does involve our openness and our willingness to actually experience pain. And how much of that is like, heal, like bringing up past, past stuff, like, you know, the past, failures, like of my marriage, the past failure of my marriage, the past breakdown of other relationships. And those pieces of the concept of, can I be a good mom, a single uh -huh. mom right sure. now? Can I sure. be a good mom and have someone else in my life? And that is like, you know, there's, there's a huge wall right there. Well, I, I, well, I, see life as a both and so my immediate answer is yes you can of course you can do both you can you can be a great single mom and you can have someone important in your life as well so it's not in me in my mind and, and again i in my, we were talking what we were talking about earlier was that i had it in my mind because other i it was what i was saying to you is that i know how i invest myself in relationship and i didn't have the sense of myself as much as i live a both and life i didn't have the sense of myself as being able to get my work out into the world and have that relationship. And, and it was like, uh, no, it's actually possible to do both. I could have had somebody in my life that was fully supportive of what I was doing and, and helped support me through that process as opposed to not. So, so it really is shifting some of our thinking and, and even reframing failure, a failed marriage, if you will. It's like, no, you transitioned out of that marriage for whatever reason you transitioned out. And that there were valuable learnings that came with that. It doesn't mean it was failed. Yeah. It, didn't turn, it didn't turn out the way you imagined. And, and so that's the, that's the grief part of it. But, but that we, we learn from every, or we can learn from every experience we go through. Um, so it's something that transitioned and didn't turn out the way you imagined. And, and we can still live this both and world. Yeah, both and. And so 
Definitely. I like that reframing of transitioned, you know, transitioned into where I am now, which I never would have seen before. And, and that's beautiful. And that concept, I think many women and, and probably men deal with this too. It's like, okay, I have to focus on this one thing, like for you, getting your work out into the world, you know, this, you know, this mastery, right? Being masterful in one area. How do we have room now to be in this other, opening ourselves up for you know, that perfect, that ideal, imperfect relationship. Right, right, right. right. Again, it's, it, 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 and what I was saying earlier too, is that my values have shifted, right? And, and, and that, and on my end, I, I have gotten a, a major piece of work out there. I, there's still much more I want to do and, and many more lives that I hope to impact in a really positive way. And I'm also, and, and I would say we're doing this kind of at the, as hopefully as COVID is winding down um, or the impact, the, the strongest impact of it is winding down. And that I, I, um, I'm also mindful of what the experience of being alone has been like for a year, right? So, it, so some things were made much more poignant because there was a lot more opportunity to reflect. So let's talk about that. What are some of the things that like being alone and you're, where do you live now? I'm in Los Angeles. Los Angeles. And so yeah. that's been pretty isolating, right? And, yeah. and what yeah. you've been dealing with. And so how has this, like, how have you transitioned in this year? Well, I, again, I think that it, 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 <laughs> the immediate the thing that happened was there was actually an upsurge for me in work. Uh, understandably, because because people were trying to make sense of it's like, oh my God, what are we doing? What's going on? How do we handle this? And and so there and and the really the way I looked at this whole time period is that it's been a time period of profound loss and profound grief, along with a heightened sense of vulnerability. And so most people, I think, would identify it as anxiety. I describe it as vulnerability. This mm -hmm. sense, both a both a kind of a felt body sense uh, as well as an emotional sense that we could get hurt mm -hmm. uh, and and certainly we we see have seen and saw all of that and and that and that so that i was in touch with that kind of level of poignancy uh, i have a, a a parent that is still alive uh, and is uh, edging ever so much closer to the century mark and and doing well given the circumstances and uh and so the inability to connect with family um so it's dealing with sadness that related to that it was a lot of alone time um and and wondering and again given the circumstances surrounding the year because I, I really saw the year as not just it wasn't a simple thing it wasn't just covid right it, for me it was like five major influences at the minimum uh, that included uh, not only COVID, the economic downturn, political instability, social uh, unrest, but and or, uh, important social unrest, yeah. um, and climate instability, and and so it's like these five things happening throughout this whole period. It's uh, it's been a time of um, deep reflection and 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 really heightened also my awareness of the importance of, of connection and staying well connected during this time. Mm -hmm. And opening up for that relationship. So Absolutely. having an authentic Absolutely. relationship. So we talked, uh, we touched on a little bit about what Mary Morrissey said to you. So what, what is it she said and how is that moving you? Uh, well, it's the, she, what she said to me was that, that I, what I said a few moments ago is that I could have, I could during this time period have had somebody in my life that was both supportive, uh, that one, I could have somebody in my life and that that person was actually very supportive of what I was doing. So it wasn't, it didn't have to be an either or. Yeah. It could have been, it could have been a both. Both yeah. and, right. Yeah. And so like now with understanding, understanding that, what are, what are next steps? Uh, well, next steps, it's, uh, I guess it's doing it the way people do it in the uh, 2020s, which is online. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and at the time of COVID and, and, uh, and at the time of 2020 with all the tech. So, um, so it's just, it, right now, it's just a kind of a process of, of figuring out how to negotiate that. So Yeah. Yeah. And to, you know, again, just that part of vulnerability, opening yourself up and, 
and letting people know, you know, we had Bella Gandhi on at the um, end of last year and, you know, talking about dating and she has her Smart Dating Academy. And so um, I have been working with her and, and one of her um, coaches, Lindsay, and it's been really important for me because it can fall back into um, work mode you know, uh, putting uh -huh. relationships sure. on a shelf and, and not following kind of a flow of just, okay, you know, every, you know, there is, there is definitely someone, some ones out there for us. And it's right. just a, a process and not to let anxiety or, you know, that vulnerability put us back into our shell. You and I are both, in, I think you're introverted naturally. I'm naturally introverted. And so like, it's so easy for me to just like get back into my cozy, cozy uh -huh. comfort cocoon. Right, right, right. No, yeah, no, it's, it is, it's a, it is a constant push. I think the other thing that becomes really important here, Anna, is that, is that it's also paying attention to really what you value. Yes. And, and so, you know, it's, it's sitting down and actually generating a list of what you want. Um, and, and my thing is that it's not a matter of just putting down kind of, and I'm not just talking about kind of uh, physical characteristics or those kinds of things. I'm talking about the, the whole thing where you're, you're addressing what you want at an emotional level, maybe at a spiritual level, mm -hmm. physical level, and not just what you want for in the person, but what you want in terms of how the relationship functions. Mm -hmm. So it's so it's then writing down that oh that we're we're uh, you know that the warmth and affection comes easily and is frequent, or mm -hmm. that um, that we um, we engage uh, comfortably well, if you will, in conflict, and and the effort is to always resolve that all the way through. Mm -hmm. So it's a win-win for both of us. So it's also generating the kinds of values that you hold for the relationship too. Yeah, yeah, completely. One of the things that uh, Bella Gandhi said is that she, she asked me, what are the things you want in a relationship? And sure enough, I was like, I could fire off a whole bunch of, you know, a whole bunch of things. And then she asked me, well, think of some people in your life that make you happy. And, you know, you're just happy to be around them. You're happy to be with them. And so, you know, I, I did. And she goes, well, what are those? Why are you happy with these people? What makes you happy? She right. said, you stay in a relationship because you're happy, not because of your wants. You're, what makes you happy? Yep. Your yep. needs. Yep. And, and I reflect on that. And someone I dated, um, uh, he said, you know, like when you think of someone and you smile, that's a really good sign. Right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yep. Yep. And, and laughter is a super important one for me. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Joan, I want to circle back in this sure. concept of like, when we are feeling this anxiety, like, okay, so here, you know, getting out in the world, you know, meeting people, having all those, those challenges and that anxiety is coming up in your book, 90 seconds to a life you love, you love, you teach us how to, you know, regain kind of that, it's almost like, I, I want to call it a reality check, but explain this, explain this process and help us through well, it. Well, there's a couple different things here. So there, for me, there's layers. So, if, so the, the first part of it for me is to, uh, is actually, let me start with taking away the word anxiety. Okay. I'm not a big, I'm a psychologist, but I'm not a big fan of the word anxiety. And I'm also not a big fan of the word fear. So go figure, right? Um, and I the, and part of, and I, I'll explain why I, I don't like that word, but or either one of them. But though my thing early on, as when I got into my kind of my professional life, was was noticing how difficult it was for people to experience and kind of move through unpleasant feelings. And and as much as our thinking can really trip us up, what I found is that our difficulty handling these unpleasant feelings actually was worse. That, that people had no sense of being capable in life or feeling capable in life or handling what life kind of throws at us or we deal with um, if, they weren't, if they were not able to handle these unpleasant feelings. So then I started kind of over time gathering, it's like, what are these feelings? And, and repeatedly a certain number of feelings kept on coming up. 
But it was also, well, then how do I, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but it's like, then how do I get them to, to actually stay in them? So, so what ended up happening as the years progressed is that I sort of came up with a formula that a friend of mine called the Rosenberg Reset. So the, the, the language stuck, it was like, oh, okay, kind of like that. And so the reset is one choice, eight feelings, 90 seconds. And the one choice is helping people lean into awareness as opposed to avoidance. So the idea here is that you want to be as aware of and in touch with as much of your moment to moment experience as possible. So it means staying away from distraction. Mm -hmm. uh, what's, what's distraction look like? Well, substance use, like you know, alcohol or drugs, social media, screens. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. For m men, more often than women, it's sex or porn. Um, or it could be sh women a little bit more than men could be shopping. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just, so there's all sorts of distractions we can get into. And those are the mo real obvious ones. Um, but harsh self-criticism, for instance, for me is a distraction. Um, having feelings about having feelings is a distraction. Oh, and wait, I, okay, wait, let's talk about that. Cause that's gotta be a very universal one. I mean, having feelings about having feelings, like, you know, you just end up with a cycle. Yeah, right. Well, I, if I, so if I'm angry, then I'm disappointed. That's a distraction from the disappointment, mm -hmm. right? If I'm disappointed that I'm angry, <laughs> then it's a, it's a distraction from the anger, right? So, so there's, and I think I've identified at least 35 different ways that we distract ourselves <laughs> in the book. And some of them are as nuanced as that. And, and so, so yes, that, that we get into all these sorts of ways of distracting from what's really going on. So I want people to lean into the awareness and to move as much as they can away from the avoidance. And then the second part is the eight feelings. So, so the eight feelings are sadness, shame, helplessness, anger, vulnerability, embarrassment, disappointment, and frustration. And so it's like, why these eight? Uh, and because people go to fear, anxiety, guilt. No, none of them are on that list. It's these eight because they're the most common everyday reactions, okay, most common spontaneous everyday reactions to things not turning out the way we want or the way we perceive that we need. Mm -hmm. So it's the everydayness. It's that quality is why I chose those. And and then the, the 90 seconds part is really much more tied to the method. So, so, then, so then what's the deal with leaning into unpleasant feelings? Well, the, the first thing is understanding that we're one interconnected whole. We're not a, we're not a brain or, or mind and then a body. We're actually one unified whole. And in being that unified whole, it's understanding that, that our body, most of us tend to come to know what we feel emotionally through bodily sensation first. Mm -hmm. So think the heat of embarrassment into the face. I might see your redness or you might see my redness, but what the person is experiencing internally is probably the heat, right? And the heat is the bodily sensation as an example, or a, or a kind of a downward sensation in the chest for sadness or disappointment, right? Yes. Or there, there, we can come up with all sorts of different examples. But, the, but the, there's signals, body signals, that cue us to what we're experiencing. And it happens so quickly, we don't separate the thought and the feeling, the bodily sensation or the feeling um, itself. And, and then the third part of it is uh, actually an observation that was made by Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor, who wrote the book, My Stroke of Insight. And in the book, what she says is that when a feeling gets triggered, there's a rush of biochemicals into the bloodstream that activate bodily sensations. So it's the bodily sensations I was just talking about. And those same biochemicals rush a flush out of the bloodstream in roughly 90 seconds. So, so what I began to do was to understand, one, that it wasn't that we didn't want to feel the whole range of what we felt. It's that we didn't want to feel, we didn't want to feel the bodily sensation that helped us know what we were feeling emotionally. And that that was the thing that we were trying to get away from, was that bodily sensation. That's but the, like, what we're distracting ourselves from. Exactly, exactly. So that if I get, could get people to understand that what they were trying to run away from when they were trying to run away from a feeling was simply the bodily sensation that was uncomfortable, 
and that they understood that it was um, that it was less really than probably about 90 seconds. So a given bodily sensation wave was roughly 90 seconds in nature. People would typically go, well, I can do 90 seconds, right? So my whole point here is that if you can um, lean into or experience one or more of eight unpleasant feelings, if you, I'm sorry, let me, let me rephrase this. If you can ride one or more bodily sensation waves, and the or more is important here. So if you can ride one or more bodily sensation waves of one or more of eight unpleasant feelings, you can go pursue anything you want in life. Wow. I mean, that is a powerful statement. And actually, I'm going to, we'll be break for a second. And when we come back, I'm going to share with our audience, Joan, what you walked me through at Mindshare last year, a couple of years ago now in California, when I was having this, what had an incident. So we'll come back and talk about that in just a second. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel here and get those notifications and comment below. Let me know your thoughts, what you loved and what your action step is.